Greetings all and welcome back to Witch Fix. Today I'm going to be looking at the second in Silver Ravenwolf's Witches Chillers series, Witches Night of Fear. And let me tell you, if the first book kind of put me in a bad mood and was just slightly irritating to read, this book took five years off my life and ruined all my crops. So um, we're just going to get into this. Uh, I'd like to point out that my method for um, folding down corners on pages that I want to talk about got severely tested because the book actually won't close now. There's so many corners folded over. To start with the blurb. Mirror, mirror on the wall, dot, dot, dot. Bethany Salem is a pretty normal 16 year old, except for one thing, she's a witch. When Bethany sees a murder before it happens, along with a mysterious three-eyed woman whose image keeps showing up in mirrors and glass, she and the other members of the Witch's Night Out Coven decide to investigate. Together they are drawn into a dark world of illusions and secrets, murder and magic, where nothing is as it first appears, and no one is safe. Woo, spooky. There's nothing really terrible about the blurb, it's just that the contents of the book is not really anything to do with the blurb. So you might remember at the end of the first book in the series, which is Witch's Night Out, named after the coven, Bethany decided to turn her magical murder-solving abilities to the test on another case, which is the case that her dad was working on in the first book, the case of a missing, potentially murdered little girl. And now I'm going to trigger warn some things for this book, which include, yes, the murder of children, but also um, abusive relationships, sexual abuse of a minor, and physical assault, just before I get into discussing the plot in any detail. So at the end of that book, we get told that this is the next case that Bethany and her little gang is going to be working on. But then at the start of A Witch's Night of Fear, a new murder takes place. A woman who Bethany kind of stumbles upon late at night after leaving a party. She's dead in a convenience store. And I was slightly confused and wondering whether we were actually going to investigate the little girl's murder or if that had been forgotten about. But have no fear. Silver Ravenwolf does not forget. And uh, we actually end up sort of doing both throughout the book. And then we kind of get into a mess because both of them are apparently connected somehow in a way that I'm, I'll leave it up to you to decide if it makes sense or not. Now, the first and most obvious gripe that I had while reading this book is the fact that although we don't forget about Bethany's promise to investigate the little girl's murder, we do forget some other things. So at various points throughout the book, they refer to the fact that they got into trouble a month ago. So the first book was a month before this book. And you might remember that at the end of the first book, her father's new fiancé died or was brutally torn apart by dogs, depending on which version of events you believe, in his house, in Bethany's bedroom. And uh, that, that was kind of a, a big deal, as, as you would expect. And also that she'd obviously just been like dating him to run this con thing that she was doing in the plot of the first book. This goes unmentioned in the second book. He's now dating some woman from the police station in New York where he works and they do mention that a couple of like weeks before that, like a month ago, he was dating a psychiatrist. No one mentions the fact that he was previously engaged and that the woman he was engaged to dropped dead in his fucking house. This is not mentioned at all. And I just couldn't believe that such a big thing, like this woman was the murderer in the first book, apparently a murderer, because we never really established if Joe was actually murdered. But she was the main villain of the first book. And apparently she's just winked out of existence as far as continuity goes. So take that for what it's worth. So to get fully started into this book, right at the beginning, Bethany is at a Halloween party and she has a vision. She has a vision of someone dressed as a pirate and wearing one of those like black masks that kind of cover the bit around your eyes, shooting a woman. And this is the vision that predicts the death that's about to happen. I will point out that at one point in, during this vision, she just says, freeze frame. And then it cuts to the woman dying. So like she's she's directing her own vision here. But I will point out that when they actually find the dude who did the do and killed this woman, he is not dressed as a pirate. There's very little to do with a pirate about him uh, and the fact that he was eating a chocolate bar at the time completely irrelevant so she didn't really manage to predict the murder at all i don't really know why that was included brief mention to the fact that we are back to the racially insensitive descriptions of people except now we can add a native american character to that list and uh, he's at the party 
uh, the Halloween party, and it says, His eyes scanned the crowd, but his expression said he was afraid to mingle. Tonight he was dressed in full native regalia, complete with a nasty-looking knife that appeared more than real. He'd actually be half-decent looking if he didn't hunch his shoulders and did something better than a ponytail with his hair. He always wore baggy clothes, like he slept in them or something. His eyes were strange, like his gene pool was touched by Mongolian Khan. Too bizarre. So, um, special mention for that. Anyway, Bethany leaves the party, discovers the body at the gas station, and that sort of sets things in motion for the rest of the book. Page 22 is a little bit confusing because they're talking about, basically, the discovery of the body, after which Bethany is not put into therapy or given any time of school or anything like that you know that you would expect when you find a dead body she just kind of goes on like nothing's happening so Ramona who's her housekeeper and sort of Wiccan instructor says besides you've seen dead people before Ramona's seen them before your father bless him sees them all the time no big deal she flicked her wrist twisting the spatula in the air So I was trying to think of when Bethany would have seen a dead person before because the murder in the previous book was meant to be Joe, who I don't think she actually saw. He had a car accident and she wasn't with him. So I feel like they were talking about the dad's ex-girlfriend. But as far as continuity about his relationships go, it's never mentioned. And it's mentioned that he was dating other people instead of her in the right time frame when he would have been dating her. But then it goes on to say, on the same page... If Carl Salem thought Bethany's studies with Ramona caused her any difficulty, like that precognitive episode at the Halloween party, he would insist that they cease. He was broad-minded, but only to a point, and this would be twice in two months that she'd been witness to a murder. So, again, she wasn't a witness to Joe's murder, as far as I'm aware. He had a car accident, she wasn't with him, and her dad's girlfriend wasn't murdered. She either dropped dead of a heart attack or a cardiac infarction or whatever they said it was slash got torn to death by dogs but that was said to be an astral event that didn't actually really happen it was just there to be dramatic so i'm legitimately confused as to whose murder she is meant to have witnessed i will say that this book kind of solves one of the problems that i had with the first book where no investigation seemed to happen between you know them deciding there was a crime to be solved and the solution to that crime actually being revealed they didn't seem to do anything except fuck around uh, with completely irrelevant shit until the end in this they actually do do a little bit of i guess investigation because bethany takes some files from her dad's computer so she can read up on the annabelle case which is the little girl and later they also break into the school guidance counselor's office to investigate a guy called michael who we'll get to plot wise in a moment so they did do some investigation and that made me a little bit happier and generally just meant that there was more of a plot to follow it's just that at the end of the book that plot went completely bananas the two main plot strands in the book are the investigation of what happened to the lady who was killed at the convenience store, who turns out to be the mother of a school contemporary of Bethany's called Gillian. Also, um, the storyline of what happened to this Annabelle girl and the fact that she's missing slash maybe dead. And a third sort of storyline about Nam, who was the Chinese member of the witch's night out coven. Um, She's got a boyfriend and she turns up at various points in the novel looking like she's lost a lot of weight, looking like she has a black eye, refusing food, not wanting to hang out with her friends. So it's pretty clear that something's up with Nam. It does, however, take a ridiculously long time for her friends to do anything about it, as we shall see. Nam has a new boyfriend. His name is Michael. And he started at their school at the beginning of the school year. And you don't actually see him for most of the novel. Nam talks about him and is constantly going off to meet him. But he doesn't actually appear. Um, He's kind of noticeable in his absence. And also Sydney is like a new male character who's being mentioned. So I kept getting the two of them confused. Particularly as they kept having conversations that featured both of them. And they would refer to both of them as he. And it was kind of unclear at times who they were talking about. But Michael is Nam's boyfriend and Sydney is the Native American guy who kind of wants to join their coven and wants to get to the bottom of what happened. He also might be someone that Silver Ravenwolf wants us to think of as a suspect because he had a big knife at the Halloween party. And also he is second on the scene of the murder after Bethany. But I don't really understand how we would think that he was involved because he turned up after Bethany and he had a knife not a gun, which is what was used to kill the convenience store lady. So 
swinging a miss on the old red herring. There is, however, a slight mystery around Sydney. He keeps looking at things that aren't there and talking to them, which seems like a prime sign of psychosis, but is revealed at the very end of the book to be the fact that he's basically some kind of medium and he sees dead people this kind of plays into that whole thing of silver ravenwolf saying that these books are meant to be real life wicker real life magic if i saw someone talking to the air about things i would wicken or no probably suggest that they seek professional help and even without that there are still quite a lot of incidences throughout the book where magic stuff happens but is then explained away by coincidence for example um, bethany squares off with some chick in the school bathroom and throws her hand out in annoyance and like yells at her and the mirror over the sink breaks and then bethany says oh yeah it was cracked anyway and then the janitor comes in to clean it and says oh i've been cleaning that mirror for 20 years and it's always had a crack in it um so it feels like kind of silver's putting stuff in to bump up the drama level but also having to try and explain it away in ways that don't always work because how we're just throwing up your hand and pointing at a mirror cause it to break even if it was cracked the plot of the book kind of trundles along we get basically a lot of meetings between Bethany and her friends. She occasionally sees Sydney places and he tries to tell her things but is very vague and then has to run away. At various points they wonder what's up with Nam, why is she being so secretive and reticent to meet up with them. Bethany thinks privately about the cases, the murders, but doesn't really make a huge amount of progress. The big piece of progress kind of happens on a coincidental trip to New York. Uh, Bethany and her friend Tilly go up to New York to stay in the apartment that her dad has there and just do a little bit of shopping about town with his new girlfriend replacing his old girlfriend who no one remembers who is a police sergeant. This happens around page 140, 145 and comes just as I was sort of losing interest in the main plot but basically what happens is they go to a Wiccan shop which is conveniently very close to the police station they go in Bethany asks if she can use the restroom and the proprietor who's quite friendly uh, she lets the, her go into the bathroom and says oh just don't disturb any of the candles that I've got burning in the shower because they're part of a spell so Bethany goes in and being the curious little cat that she is, she opens the like glass shower partition and sees black candles arranged in a pentagram on some like sand drawing. And on it is a picture of the missing girl. Bethany assumes that this is a curse or something bad that's being done to the little girl. I would assume black candles, protective magic, soaking up negativity. Maybe she's trying to catch the girl's killer. It's far more likely that that's the case and not that she is doing something sacrifice and weird with this little girl which you'd think that Bethany as a practitioner of Wicca would know because the proprietor of the shop is also Wiccan but no she decides to do a quick spell reversal on this and then basically just blow out all the candles and muck up the drawing at which point she then thinks that the pr proprietor of the shop Linux which I swear is like a kind of open source software, um, but that she is involved in the disappearance. And when Sergeant Laszlo, who's her dad's new squeeze, comes in and seems to know Linux, she gets very scared and assumes that they are both in on the murder. She then tells her dad about this and then he has to tell her later after she's freaked out and thinks that he's going to have his new girlfriend and this lady arrested, that the proprietor of the Wiccan shop is actually the missing girl's mother, which isn't hard to see coming i mean i definitely didn't assume that she was the murderer and it was kind of annoying that so much time was given to bethany assuming that either way we introduce annabelle's mother to the story and that's when things kind of get moving on the annabelle case it's at this point that bethany decides that it would be the best idea in the world to download some of her dad's confidential work files from his computer without his knowledge so that she can try and work on the case tilly rightly points out that this is a stupid idea and highly illegal but eventually they do do it and the one piece of useful plot information this yields later on in the book is that her dad interviewed a lot of people about the case and one of them had the last name of star and that is also the last name of someone that his current girlfriend sergeant maslow was seeing previously and had mentioned in passing but bethany dismisses this initially as a coincidence she finds this out on page 205 of a book which discounting all the extra stuff at the end 
is not actually that long. It's about 276 pages. So we're already under 100 pages to the end. And this is when like probably the first major clue drops as a result of all of the stuff that's been building in the plot about the Annabelle case. The case of the dead woman in the convenience store is largely abandoned. Um, the only thing that really happens is that the guy who is at the petrol station at the same time as Bethany, who refuses to call the police and then drives off in a hurry, he is found dead in a presumed traffic accident, which was used a lot in the previous book because, as you might remember, Joe died in an assumed traffic accident and then Nan was injured in an assumed traffic accident. So I'm starting to think that maybe Silver Ravenworth just has to think about cars because it's getting used a lot. Um, but either way, that's basically the last thing that we really hear about it. And from then on, the plot mainly focuses on Annabelle. Um, but fear not, because it does get picked up again later in an unexpected way. Round about the page 225 mark, we get some personal revelations about Sydney and Gillian, who is the daughter of the murdered woman. They're not really hugely relevant to the mystery. and They don't really bring up any motive for the crime. So they're largely irrelevant. Um, but I will mention that Sydney and Gillian state that they are half siblings because of an affair that Sydney's dad had. And that when Gillian was younger, his mum wanted to adopt her because she'd always wanted a daughter. This is sort of put in, I feel like, as, it, as if it's meant to be a motive. But nothing is really developed from that. And none of the characters really seem to think that it's a motive. Bethany doesn't ruminate on it at all. So I basically forgot about it as soon as it happened. And that's a pretty good thing because in all the banana shit that happened at the end of the book, it didn't become relevant in the slightest. Now, as we get into the conclusion of the plot, I want you to remember that this book is 276 pages long. That's like the part that's actually plot. So 276 pages long. And on 242, we find out that uh, Michael, who is Nam's boyfriend, has actually been placed at the high school as some sort of witness protection type thing. He's being hidden because he's turned state's evidence on a gang that he was involved with in New York. And basically they're covering up his bad behaviour, like his drug use and his drunkenness, even though it's been reported by parents who've like seen him intoxicated. Because they don't want to deal with it, they don't want to have it raise too many questions, they don't want to have to kick him out when they're meant to be, obviously, hiding him. This makes very little sense to me. I don't know that this would be allowed, but I was prepared to stretch my credulity just a little bit. And uh, then we get into the really exciting and spicy stuff. Because we find out that Michael is currently staying in town with, like, an aunt or something, and her name is Violet Starr. And we remember the last name Starr as belonging to Sergeant Laszlo's ex-boyfriend, who is previously stated to be 22. So why is he in a high school? You might ask that question. So we find out that this person isn't even a teenager, but somehow the state and the school system, presumably, thought it would be a good idea to put him in a high school amongst vulnerable teenagers uh, to hide him while he was waiting to, like, testify against this gang now normally what they do is just stick you in a house with some police and leave you there until it's time for you to go to court really what they could have done is just sent him to stay with his aunt and they didn't have to enroll him in a school that he was too old to go to so at that point i was just like i don't believe that that could have happened and that's really where the plot started to come mostly unstuck for me because once you start believing that one thing can't have happened, it's kind of a snowball effect that you refuse to believe in anything else that the author tells you because you kind of get stuck on that one detail. And I was already kind of stuck on the disappearing dead girlfriend. So um, my tolerance was lowered. Anyway, fresh hot on the heels of this alarming discovery. Uh, the gang rounds up Gillian and Sydney. Uh, Gillian, who has smacked Bethany over the head with a pool cue because I guess the chapter needed a dramatic ending and she happened to be there. But she was also like interested in Michael, so she's kind of a love rival with Nan. They head up to the local lover's lane, which is apparently where Gillian says Michael would have taken Nan if he wanted to like terrorise her further. So they go up there to try and find him. And that is where, and to use a technical term, shit gets fucky because there's a large amount here that I just did not understand. The gang follows a trail of blood from Nam's abandoned car to some rocks at the edge of a cliff. And there they are confronted by Amanda, who is another love rival for Michael and also someone who's kind of had it in for Nam in a couple of scenes throughout the book. Uh, she was seen dropping off a box of dog poo at Nam's house because that's what people do 
and also may have been sending her threatening notes, uh, which is revealed in like the chapter before the last one. So she's there and basically has decided to go start graving bazonkers in a way that doesn't really correspond to her behaviour early in the book, which was catty, a little bit mean, but also not as unhinged as she appears in the final pages of the book. So she kind of crops up around about like 256, so 20 pages before the end. While holding Bethany at gunpoint, because I guess we can't write a climax of a book without someone pointing a gun at someone else, because that's how you know it's dramatic. She basically says that she saw Michael kill the convenience store lady, and that she was trying to blackmail him into, I guess, loving her, and he kind of freaked out. Uh, So she may have shot him, we don't know. And that she also disposed of Nam, who it reveals later on in the book is actually fine, but that she's now going to shoot them as well, because why the hell not? So we basically find out from Nam when Nam is recovered, because uh, they accidentally trick Amanda into backing off of a cliff and I guess maybe dying? I'm not sure, because this is what happens on page 259. See, said Sydney, Gillian's mother is coming to get you. Amanda backed up a step. More howls out of the darkness. Another step. Don't! screamed Bethany, but it was too late. Amanda backed up over the edge of the cliff. She shrieked as she fell into the cold blackness of the valley below. Anyway, they get over that pretty quickly and just start kind of rounding up everyone who is in the scene still and going, Oh, hey, are you okay? I may have just murdered someone, but oh well, I guess we'll all just live with that and forget about it by the next book. Now, here's the bit that I didn't understand, because Nam is meant to be recounting what happened before they got there. And as near as I can figure it, what happened was she and Michael got there. Amanda confronted Michael. There was an argument. Nam ended up going off the cliff, but fortunately landed on an outcropping. But the others, like, obviously didn't know that. And then something happened. And see if you can work out what that was from what I'm about to read from page 261 and 62. He just didn't care, not about her and definitely not about me. I ran as best I could, but there was blood in my eyes and so much pain that I ran the wrong way, tripped and slipped on the edge of the cliff. I fell off, but luckily I hit the hidden ledge underneath, Sydney whistled. And you guys thought I was a nutcase, said Gillian. They both thought I was dead, said Nam. Michael just laughed. What happened to him, asked Gillian, her voice soft and trembling. Nam gulped. I managed to crawl up to the edge and peek over. You wouldn't have believed it. Michael told Amanda to get lost. He pushed her away at least. That's what it sounded like and grabbed the gun from her at the same time. I think he hit her with it and he threatened to shoot her. Nam shook her head in disbelief. Then Gillian screamed something horrible and ran into the woods. I heard a motorcycle, a woman's voice. She accused Michael of killing a little girl. Nam almost wailed the last part. Something about Annabelle Arno. So I'm confused here because it says that Gillian starts screaming. But she's telling this story to Gillian and they weren't there at this point. This was like before they got there. So did she mean to write Amanda and not Gillian? Because that would make more sense. But then I can't get quite the sequence of events that this would be. I heard a motorcycle, a woman's voice. She accused Mike of killing a little girl. Now, it's later revealed that this is Sergeant Laszlo turning up on her motorcycle to confront Michael. But it's just confused me because I'm like, okay, but where is Amanda right now? Because... Michael was threatening to shoot Amanda at this point and then this woman turns up on a motorcycle and starts accusing him and then suddenly Amanda is sneaking up behind Laszlo and braining her with a rock and then Amanda shoots Michael and then throws him off the cliff so Michael's also dead I guess. It's just kind of bizarre and the fact that all of this mystery is being unraveled in the last like 20 pages of the book when those 20 pages are action scenes that are hard to follow it just makes the whole thing kind of pointless because There's been this mystery in the book, you want to know who did it, but if you can't tell what happened at the end, then what was even the point of reading the book? And then there's this delightful little segment from the end of the chapter on page 263. Sydney played the light to Bethany's right. That one. All eyes riveted to the light and the bloody boot jutting out from behind the boulder. Oh my goddess, exclaimed Bethany. It's Sergeant Laszlo. Tilly checked to see if she was still breathing. Dead, she said. Amanda must have been getting ready to pitch her off the cliff when we surprised her. But where did Amanda get the gun? If she hit Laszlo with a rock, where did the gun come from? Tilly checked Laszlo's body. 
her fi- fingers running over the empty shoulder holster from her. The loon screamed. So, the new girlfriend slash semi-major character, because she has been in like a fair chunk of the book, is just dead. Gets killed off screen. Gets pronounced dead by just a teenager. And then we've got the final chapter of the book, um, which is like post the death. And no one seems to give a flying fuck. They're having this little ceremony, which is um, Cindy officially joining the coven. And it's meant to be also a crossing over ceremony for um, Annabelle and also Sergeant Laszlo because they are dead. And also maybe, I guess, for Gillian's mum, Amanda and Michael, who also are dead. Because this this book has a pretty hefty body count. Um, But they're all just sort of sitting around eating potluck like this happened like years ago instead of a week it, it, it's been literally a week guys and they've seen like people they know plummet to their deaths off a cliff and her dad's girlfriend has been murdered brutally in the forest and they've caught the killer of this little girl and we still don't know anything about why he killed that little girl by the way that comes out later in the chapter but they're just sitting around joking giving each other presents because that's what you do when you join a coven and it's like this really weird mesh of the end of quite a dark crime novel because a lot of very dark stuff has happened in here we've got like michael who's this like drug using attempted rapist who was going after teenage girls um at the high school and who has killed at least two people that we know of maybe a third yes a third because he's killed animal he's killed three people one of whom is a little girl And then we've also got it meshed in with this kind of Circle of Three-esque scene where it's just everyone getting together in love and light and it's all wonderful at the end. And it just does not work for me. It just is so tonally weird that I was both kind of mildly horrified and also annoyed because it felt like none of the events of the book, even the ones that I could actually understand, had been given like the emotional gravity that those events would necessarily need. Lastly. Again, uh, as I said in the first book, everything is left motive wise to be an exposition dump right at the end, because in a 276 page book, we only get told the main motive and basically what happened on page 267. Here we find out that Sergeant Laszlo knew Michael from when he was a runaway and she was kind of a mentor to him. And then they became lovers, which is all kinds of fucked up. And then when she broke up with him, he kind of flipped out and kidnapped her friend's daughter to get back at her and then somehow accidentally killed her. Okay. And then when Gillian's mum somehow found out about his criminal past, which I don't know how she would have done because they had to like access the guidance counsellor's computer without him knowing to find out about it. But apparently Gillian's mum just knew. When she confronts him about it, randomly in a gas station shop he decides to kill her and because amanda was a witness to this she kind of got like brought into it and then went a little bit crazy because she was in love with him or thought she was which led to the scene up on the cliffs we also get told that a spooky moment that happened at the beginning of the book where bethany is basically trying to do like a spell to get to the root of the murder and a hand comes through the open window to strangle her was just Vanessa, like one of the cheerleaders, just having a laugh. So again, it feels like these dramatic things have happened. Like the guy who turned up at the gas station and then bolted because he didn't want to get caught up with the police and then is later killed in a car accident. Well, apparently Amanda just ran him off the road. But why? Because he didn't see anything. There was no reason for her to go and kill him. It feels like these things have been put into the plot to make it seem more dramatic and then have to be feebly explained later because they don't actually make a huge amount of sense and it's just very wearying to read a book that will kill off like six characters and then have it just not matter and then explain away other things with just exposition dumps that don't really make a lot of sense and it feels like no one really cares that much about the plot of this book or if they do care then they're not very suited to writing fiction and they can't really keep their facts straight as evidenced by the fact that the dad's dead girlfriend just disappears from the narrative when she was the antagonist of the previous book it just it doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me and there's a third book in the series guys and i'm gonna have to read that now because i've bought it and i refuse to just 
not read it but I'm not exactly hopeful because there's already like a loss of continuity between the first book and the second book I don't know if the third book is even going to make sense based on that and my hopes for it delivering a story that I want to read are fairly low because it seems like we've fallen into this pattern and although this book kind of put things throughout the book that made it seem like they were investigating the crime a little bit those things ultimately didn't matter and everything that happened was by coincidence um and it just makes very little sense and then the last thing that really just kind of put a shit cherry on the shit pie excuse my french was on page 273 and what we get told is uh this from bethany's dad what do we do next asked tilly her eyes gleaming carl salem knocked on the den door then entered with long lanky strides actually he said to tilly i've been talking to ramona dad exclaimed bethany jumping up and giving him a hug mr salem smiled if you all study very hard i'll let you help me with some of my cases but he held up his hand only from a distance you can use your divination skills and magic however you have to clear it with ramona first and only when she says you're ready so this guy who is a big time new yorkie policeman He's just like, oh yeah, my teenage daughter and her ragtag group of teenage friends who are just starting to practice Wicca and are being tutored by my housekeeper. I'm going to let them help me in official police cases. Because that's a legal thing that police are allowed to do. And a sensible thing that fathers allow their children to do. Like, the willing suspension of disbelief died halfway through this book. And it just feels like no one's decisions make sense. None of the way people reacting are making sense. And I'm just starting to vaguely lose it um and i'm really glad that the third book is actually the last one because i'm guessing at that point someone stopped her and they just didn't write anymore um and i feel like i've been a little bit harsh and to be fair i do think silver raven wolf is a better non-fiction writer than she is a fiction writer completely different skill set. i would be terrible at writing non-fiction i've tried it's not great but it just goes to show that you can be as good at putting facts in order at one side of things and then terrible at constructing an entirely imagined narrative on the other because oh, these just these books are just not very good in my opinion if you want to find out for yourself grab a copy get in touch let me know what you thought you can do so on twitter or by email check the description box for those and also you can drop me uh some comments on the youtube version of this podcast um always got a youtube counterpart going up as well and if you head on over to youtube if you're just a cast box listener there are videos unboxings and things that obviously don't get put up with the rest of the podcast on cast box so i'll be interested to hear your thoughts and in the meantime i'm gonna get into which is key to terror and i'll see you in the next episode